Hi, how you doing? How's everybody doing today? Pretty good. Great. Good yeah, weekend, awesome. going to get some part? Okay, well, we have a fantastic guest. Uh, oh, this young lady has had a tremendous career. She has been so many characters, so many wonderful franchises, and uh, we're going to try to cover all the bases and uh, have a little discussion, and then we'll open it up to your questions, and um, let's take them there. Welcome to Florida, again. Thank you. It's nice to be back again in Florida. Mm -hmm. Well, Florida's so big. Now We met a year ago in Central Florida, and now we're in South Florida. But I didn't know it was you, because you were dressed up in an insane costume. Do you guys see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? You know that really weird guy who sells candy to the kids? Sweet, he was crazy. I was the, I was the child catcher from yeah. Bang. <laughs> Ice cream candy, all free today. And when you showed up and you said hi, like you knew me, and I was like, and you are. You are. Yeah. Yeah. And you were like, what? Wait, you're that guy. No, I'm like that. People change clothes. I see an engineer or a, another director or something in the in the airport or in the grocery but store. But I was so I was so touched because you geeked over me. It's very rare. You go over to the star's table, the star jumps up. Let me take a picture with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know your costume correctly. Wesley, have you seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang yet? Yeah. Okay, it's a really great movie. I know it. You can probably get it on VHS. <laughs> it's on our list for tonight. <laughs> okay. it's an awesome movie. They don't have VHS. Oh, well, you have to pull the one from Grandma's Garage. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a nice Blu-ray. I've had it come out. Uh, uh, let's I, let's go. Let's go absolutely back to the beginning. Okay. Um, what? How? How, how did how did it how did it start? How did this, it start? This view? How did um, how did it lead into uh, Hey Vern? Right. Well, okay. I've always been a singer, mm -hmm. but Dad said you can't make a living being an actor. Even though I was in theater since I was eight, so I was a pre med at UCLA. Even though I sang and wrote songs since I was nine, got my first guitar when I was nine. I have written hundreds of songs, and after UCLA, I decided I'm not going to med school, even though I was pre-med, and I moved to Nashville and became a jingle singer, and <laughs> became a session jingle singer, but I never got any grown-up singing jobs. I always had to sing like a baby, which was fine, because that's what I sound like when I sing. Are there any jingles that uh, we uh, might remember? If you're or you might Nashville, remember? Um, oh, okay, there's a lot of stuff. Let's see. Um, Hot kids as hell. eat free, what it is. <laughs> Mom and dad are happy as can be, cause at Wendy's, kids eat free. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of those kind of things. And then, um, Macy, I did To Kill a Mockingbird, Tennessee Rep, Repertory Theater when I was uh, 27, playing 12-year-old scout again. Did it in high school. <laughs> and somebody saw me in that, and they booked me on a TV series called Hey Vern, It's Ernest with Jim Varney. Uh, hi Vern, it's Ernest, that guy. And, and you I never really playing. had any scenes with him, though, because you were the Skeeter character. I did have one. I played also Little Debbie. Okay. And so I had a couple scenes with Jim, but he'd be there on the set all the time. But oh, my yeah. scene was my father the clown, and I played a boy clown. I've made a living playing a boy, pretty much. Yes, and you have. And when I tell you some other weird jobs I've done, but I got into the Screen Actors Guild and thought, okay, I can stop waiting tables now. And I had been waiting tables for seven years. Have any of you served wait tables? Anybody? None of you waited tables? I was a dishwasher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, only actors and entertainment people have waited tables, I guess. Humbling. I delivered pizza, kind of in the kind same of universe. The same thing, right. Anyway, I got into the union. I moved back to Los Angeles. Uh, one of the women on the set of Hey Vernon's Ernest. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I was body doubling for the 12 year old boys on Ernest mm -hmm. Goes to Camp. And one of the moms says, um, you talk like a kid, why don't you do cartoons? And I never knew cartoons. I thought they were just their own voices. I didn't connect the two. There I was in my 20s. I had no idea that cartoons like was a whole career. So I moved back to L.A. I signed with a huge agent, and I booked it within a couple weeks, and that was 30 years ago. I've just been doing cartoons ever since. Yeah, um... So it's an easy path. <laughs> and if you really want to know how to get into voice work, I just wrote a book called Voice Over 101, How to Succeed as a Voice Actor. And I have it upstairs and I have a couple here. That'd be downstairs. Uh-huh, downstairs. <laughs> yep. That's quite all right. That's quite right. Uh, but, uh, working with Barney, is because I was a huge fan of, of Hey Burn, and I know it's blasphemy to say, but I actually enjoyed it better than, than Paul Rubin's uh, PD show. Oh, yeah. Even though it lasted only one season, because it was just, it was so insane in the creativity, and uh, and yeah, what, what, was, what was Barney like? Because I always heard he was um, actually, he was a very Barney, distinguished regular yes, actor. Very well read. Fell into this, yeah. and, but he ran with it. Yeah. He was, um, 
very nice man, very well read, very cultured. You wouldn't know it from his caricature, yeah. but yeah, great guy. Great guy. And then, um, so after that, would, would you say to say that Peter Pan and the Pirates might have been your kind of breakout yeah. voice of role? Um, they were looking for the voice of Tinkerbell, and uh, a guy named Jason Marsden was doing Peter, and um, Tim Curry was doing Captain Hook, and I book booked the voice of Tinkerbell for like 65 episodes, and uh, that was like my big thing. And that's a hard one to say. Did anybody remember that one? Uh, Peter Pan and the Pirates. Peter Pan and the Pirates. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say because it, 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 like, it's, it's, it's still in like sort of a legal limbo with regards to DVD releases. Is that, I don't know. I, but I, the the I crazy the crazy story somebody told me was that the, the library of the company was putting out the time was bought out by another company and then Disney actually bought out that company and I've heard rumors from my friends at Disney that Disney wants to keep it buried because they don't want that to be confused with their version of Peter right, Pan. Right, because it's definitely not a Disney version of Peter Pan. No, but it was a, a yeah, remarkable cast and actually pretty literate storytelling for it, its time. Are we answering questions as we go? We can if we want, whatever your, whatever your pleasure is. Do you have a question back there? It's not Peter Pan and the Neverland Pirates. It's okay. Peter Pan and the Pirates, a different show. Uh, you, you said Tim Curry as a Captain Hook. Yeah, that, that's what I'm. Did that, that's what, is that what it was called? And I'm just stupid. I don't know. All right, probably. You're probably right. I don't know anything. I do. <laughs> I remember this guy called the Nostalgic Rig would talk about it, and he really liked this, and it's it seemed like a good show. Like, it you was. wouldn't believe all the people. If you IMDb the cast, I don't know if they go back that far, but it does. a crazy talented cast. All these little boys, these um, eight to thirteen year old little boys that I worked with, and now they're huge voice artists. I mean, they're still around, and uh, Scotty Menville, and and of course Jason Marsden, who was just a little bitty guy back though he's still little, but you know what I mean. He has booked all those amazing things. So you, yeah. Um, well, I was so surprised that you worked on that show, even though I wasn't, never watched it. I wasn't born in 1991. Don't you start with me. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it's a joke, because you're calling me old. No, no, I'm saying yeah, I, 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 I never watched Fox Kids until 19. Well, anyway, so at the time, you transitioned to Bobby's World Season 2 with Jackie at the time? Well, you were working with Peter Pan and the Pirates, because I know both of those shows were on Fox Kids, but I never Yeah, they really were different them. times. Um, I was doing... Uh, because I wasn't born yet. I was born in 1980. I was um, doing some other weird job. They uh, needed a body stunt double for a movie called Free Willy, the first Free Willy with the whale. And they needed a, a short boy who was really a, a, an adult who was a scuba diver. So I met with Warner Brothers and I said, I'm a scuba diver and I play boys on camera. And I, so they flew me down to Mexico and I'm the body stunt double in Free Willy and I rode that whale for seven weeks. So like when you watch the movie and the boy trips and hits his head and falls and drowns and the whale re rescues him, that whole thing's me. But during that filming I would fly back to Los Angeles for Bobby's World, Howie Mandel's show. Which was another very, very entertaining one. Oh, that was a great show. What kind of prep do you have to go through to to be a, a stunt person on a whale? Well, I mean, I I'm, not a, I'm not a stunt person. I'm, you know, an animal rescuer and an advanced scuba diver. Mm -hmm. So they did have a, a stunt person there. Okay. And they had a whale trainer and they had the medics always on deck and sure. a jacuzzi because the whale tank, as you know, is like in the low 60s. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, it was, they'd take me to the Y every day and make me swim laps and I had breath holding and just a lot of, it's like um, trying to make friends with a vicious Rottweiler. He's nah. not vicious, but they're dangerous animals. Yes. They're very big animals. If they decide they want to play, they can take you under and play with you. And they don't know you can't breathe underwater. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time underwater with a, um, a spare air or a hookah line. It's, um, it's like a can of hairspray you strap to your arm with a regulator and you can breathe like underwater or they have this hose that comes down and you can breathe and you don't have to have the tank on your back. Anyway, that was a cool job. I don't want you to think I would do it again though. <laughs> I don't believe in whales in captivity and had they asked me to do it today, I would not do it and I don't support it at all. But I didn't feel that way that many years ago. I wasn't socially well, the, aware. So, yeah, it's awareness. Yeah. yeah.
Did a question, dude? Um, how do you have fun voicing Nurgle Jr.? Mm. Did I have fun voicing yeah, Nurgle like, yeah, Jr.? Like, yeah, I got to channel my complete weirdness. Right? He's so Being like, he's like, why? He's doing weird guy. <laughs> why? He likes doing things that are not acceptable. Yeah. When he gets angry. With, like, with Richard Horvitz, how is your relationship with him as Billy? Um, I just have a relationship with Richard as a fellow voice artist. I mean, when we're in the studio, it's, you know, you do your work, you do your lines, and he's a very intelligent, great family guy. All of us voice artists kind of live in the same square half mile. So he's a great guy. Love Richard. You had a, uh, okay. you had a, you had a little interesting bit in uh, the history of Archie. You were in the Archie, you were the first live action midge. <laughs> <laughs> From Archie's, Archie's return to, to Riverdale. Riverdale and back, right? I yeah. was cast as, as Midge Mason. Um, Who had been divorced from Moose, I believe. No, I think they were married at the they, time. They were Moose, married at the time? Okay. Yeah, a big giant man. Yeah. Yeah. That was funny. But that, yeah, that, that was, was that. with um, oh, someone who became really famous after that. I can't remember. There was one breakout role. Yes. Of all the voices that you've ever voiced for, who was your favorite? That one. Which one? I don't know. <laughs> I like them all. They're so fun. You know, Jimmy Neutron's probably the most, you know, well recognized one, but I think Jackie on Bobby's World. That one's really fun. <laughs> Jackie. I call her my Valiant character. They would be like, okay, bless. Okay, Bobby. It, it took so. I had to bring it down so small for Jackie. That was challenging. Can you tell us about your experience doing that? Yeah, Natch Bell, directed by Jeff Nimoy. It came back, Zatch was naked, so they had to color him in a blue dress. So from Japan, all those hundreds of episodes, um, by the t some of them were colored, some of them were not when I got to see them. But it's an anime show, so you uh, go into the studio and you watch line by line and uh, throw in the voice. And we usually saved, um, what's his evil half's name? Reno. Yeah. That one was a little painful spot to do, so we'd always save that till the end of the session. Because he was like, kind of neck, you know, like there. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it can be grueling, but really fun. And I didn't know if he was going to have so many fans. You never know, you know, what legs the show is going to grow and how people are going to love it or not. But uh, it was fun doing the evil part of him, too. And then we decided, oh, well, how are we going to make people remember him? So we made up a signature laugh for him that, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> On a, a speaking of legs and fantastic casts, uh, Adam's Family, Wednesday, I, John Aston, Ruth Buzzy, and that was, that was a prime example sort of, you, uh, was it John Chan? Oh. I'm sure it was. I really, IMBD said it was Ruth Buzzy. It was I could have arched. It was not. No. All right, now I'll write this. But also you had Rob Paulson, Jim Cummings. I mean, that was kind of almost your graduating class of your era of, of, of talent coming out of that show. Well, I hadn't worked with Carol Channing before or since, and I hadn't worked with John Astin. I mean, I met Sean at conventions, yeah. and I was like, hey, I work with your dad yeah, on the yeah. show. He then he would be friendly. No, he's adorable. <laughs> but... Um, Huge fun cast with Rip Taylor, uh, yeah. Russell Soul, right? Mm -hmm. And wow. Rob Paulson and Jeannie Elias, and yeah, all those people. Pat Fraley. And it was when uh, Hanna Barbera was still there. Yeah. We recorded at the Hanna Barbera studio. It was like right, right after the right after the, the, the remake movie, so they're trying to yeah. talk about that. And I remember one time we were recording and they said, Jonathan Winters is down the hall in the next room. And we were all like, well, can we get out of session? And they're like, okay, go run down the hall. We all ran down the hall to see Jonathan Winters, and he was sitting at one of the director's desks just going on about something. Wow. He just, no, it was like a wind-up toy. <laughs> That's great. He was, he was. His, his, his improv skills, people have forgotten how much strong of an improviser he was. And Same. he would just sit down and dock it at Johnny, and they would, he would go for six minutes at a time, and he would not stop. Yeah. There's no wonder Robin Williams worshipped him. Hard to explain how fascinating it is, but it, it, I got to beat him that day. That is, that is pretty impressive. And then uh, Tasmania, Felix the Cat, and then Life with Louie, which was, according to, yeah, according to, according to your dossier, you did a little bit of it. Oh, I may have done it. 
Tasmania, I was his little brother, Jay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
question is this. What's your favorite Jimmy Neutron episode? I like them all. I like, um, like when pants attack. Oh, that one was funny. Because uh, Rob Paulson is so hilarious. And, um, you know, they just said, Rob, just sing, us, sing anything. I don't even know if it was that episode. Then. Morning in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and then I like the what? Valentine episode where he and Cindy almost kiss. And um, let's see. Is that the one where they're on the island? I like that one too. My favorite is the one where you and Sheen were in that video game and Carl in the lab. Like, yeah, and that's by Ultra Lord and that robot. I forgot his name. Yeah, that, that one was one of my favorites. <laughs> and, and, and the dinosaur one. And, and Bulby doing slap, 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 clack, clack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's slap, a little yes. um, trivia for the dinosaur one that I just don't tell anybody. Don't post this. No, I um, <laughs> I decided I'd have Botox a couple days before, and I didn't. It was my first time. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to get Botox that that numbed your nerves on your lips. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I got the script for the Jimmy Neutron episode delivered because they didn't send them to you. Email them. You, know, you delivered it to your house. And I was looking at all these dinosaur names. And it was like Placosimus and Plum. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't talk. I think I had to postpone the episode because my lip didn't work. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Note to self, don't give Botox on your lips. <laughs> But you're in California, Hollywood, everybody gets it all the time. Yeah, but not on your lips. That's true. You have to get it elsewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Cover yours. Um, uh, after, um, go a little bit into uh, Grim Adventures, yes. Mandy and all that. Uh, that. That's another one that sticks with a lot of people. Now, it used to be called something else, and then they changed the name, right? It was the Grim of Adventures of Billy Mandy. Billy Mandy, yeah. And then they changed it to... Just, just Billy and Mandy? I, I think so. Grim's Adventures. Just Grim's yeah. Adventures, yeah. yeah. Hi, girls. You coming in or you're just going to stand there so you can leave if you want? <laughs> Don't. Everybody wants to leave if they want. You can come in. <laughs> we'll all stare at you. <laughs> come on. Um, that show we all recorded all together at Cartoon Network. Really? Which is like my favorite when you get to record together. Bobby's when we recorded together. Adam's family was together. Um, Jumanji was together. Tasmania, did I say that? And also Grim Adventures, um, Billy Mandy, we were all together. Um, I had a tough time when um, sometimes we'd have Dee, ba Dee Bradley Baker in the cast, and I, I really can't be in the same room as him. He's the funniest person I've ever met. I can't speak. He makes me laugh so hard. It's really difficult to be around that man because he's the most funniest guy I've ever met ever. I don't know what it is about him. But no, it's great watching Richard's face turn red and Greg Nichols be so brightening as uh, Grim, I guess. Yeah. 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 No, he's really scary when he talks. Go on. And speaking of scary, uh, probably your, your modern signature role, of course, uh, Dracula. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dracula, <laughs> Monster High. Another one that I had no idea what was going to happen with that one. They didn't even give you the name when you go to audition. They give you this fake script that has nothing to do with the character, and it was called um, Meadow Hearts. And everybody was auditioning for Meadow Hearts. That's what they do at Mattel. They give you the first initials because they don't tell you the name of the show. In fact, Evans for Family was called something else up until the day we recorded, then they tell us what the name of the show was. You have to sign NDAs all over the place. Um, and I've been, I've been Draculaura from the inception. Okay. Actually, they had another uh, Draculaura, but she couldn't do a Transylvanian accent, so I replaced her. Huh. But that was in spec stage. Right. But I've been it ever since. Yeah, it's, I think we're going on, how long has it been? Like seven years or something? It's been a really long time. It's, it's, it's still trucking along. Yeah, and, you know. it's doing good. And the next movie is actually the best movie. They're, they're, the next movie is Welcome to Monster High, so it rewinds all the way to the beginning of when they had Monster High, and that's September 27th. It's gonna be on network TV, I think. Yeah, on network TV, so you can watch it. Oh, that's right. Yes, Leslie. Yeah. What, what about the other movie with the 
something wishes the other one uh-huh another one of the monster high movies yeah yeah there's been a whole bunch of movies we've done was it called three wishes i think 13 was, wishes i think it was the 15 wishes. 15 wishes yeah yeah um again i i have crs can't remember stuff <laughs> Good focus. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Yeah, how was it being the voice of Zap and Zap Bell? And if, if you would be so inclined to uh, just do any random line you remember. Did you come late? Yes. <laughs> no, we covered that at the beginning, but I'll do it again for oh, you. I'm so sorry. We I Don't be. I love for people to ask about John. He goes, um,. That's his lab. And then, what's the name of the really mean guy, his brother? Zeno. Zeno. It was hard because we'd save that session till later in the day because it hurt my voice to do that one. And um, that's pretty much all, like, all I remember. CRS. <laughs> and Jeff Nimoy um, directed them. And uh, there were a lot of them. And I think everyone that comes to my table about Zatch Bell asked me why we didn't finish the series. And I don't know why, I, and we may have, maybe they just didn't air them. But I wish it had finished to make everybody have some closure. I like closure, and apparently a lot of people didn't have closure on that project. The anime ends in the cliffhanger, though, anyway. I have a question. Well, what? I was saying the anime ends in the cliffhanger. Yeah, that's what I heard. So even then there's no closure? You really should watch it. I have a question. Can you move your water bottle? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Is that better? Much better. Oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> All right, Put on the non wrinkly face. Young lady right there. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, when you're, you've had jobs with big corporations and big companies that are famous, how do you get those auditions? Would it be from knowing someone who's worked at the company before, or did you? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a book called How to Succeed as a Voice Actor. Um, it, I'm an actor. Most of my, I have on camera agents, voice agents, commercial agents. And the voice agent uh, gets you voice job, voice auditions. Agents don't get you jobs. They get you the audition, then it's your job to audition and hopefully book it. So you never really know uh, who is behind the job. When the audition comes out, you are given the character description, the picture, and the script or the sides of the copy. Mm. You read for it, usually at your home studio, sometimes at the agent's office, and then you just sit back and wait or forget about it because I wouldn't know if I was auditioning for, I mean, they may say it's DreamWorks, they may say it's Netflix, but usually not. You just never know. Did you know you were auditioning for Speedy Alka Seltzer? I did. And that was a huge audition process. It was a national audition, so from LA to New York, and I think there were three or four callbacks to replace Dick Beals, who was on Adam's family with me. And uh, he had passed away, and they brought Speedy back, so I was Speedy Alpha Seltzer. Do you guys remember him? Yes. You know, it's a cold truth. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Young lady in the wings. Um, I wanted to ask, what was your favorite thing about voicing Coco? Um, that she's such a snot. <laughs> <laughs> I like that she's such a brat. Okay. True. Yeah. And she was a know-it-all. Oh, yeah. I think that's well, probably it. I really like that. <laughs> and I heard rumors they might be remastering it. Well, it is true. It was announced at E3 of this year. It was confirmed. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And it's coming back in Skylanders, so. Yeah. So I can't really tell you if I already was in the studio recording it or not. Yeah, do it right here. I, I, when I was a kid, I used to watch all these kind of cartoons uh, at my grandparents' house. But the one show that always came on in the morning was Jumanji, and now oh, yeah. I love that show. Because it was different from all the other shows. Everyone was all nice and cartoony, but this one was a little bit more darker in the way it was like, you know, scripted and stuff. I wasn't uh, being with Bill. I love that guy. He is, you know, Bill Fogerbachy, he plays Patrick on SpongeBob. The funniest, nicest man you ever want to know. I mean, I could only see his belly button most of the time because he's, he's tall. 
about six eight. Yeah, I'm But when you're sitting down, you're more head level. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, really nice guy, super fun, and a, a excellent voice actor. Yeah. A lot of on camera actors um, segue into voice work, and it's not seamless. Yeah. It's a different craft, it's a different set of skills. But he's excellent at it, obviously, yeah. and he great. he does that thing that he does, which you know everybody might think that to be a voice actor you have to do so many different characters although I have like this this whole army of people in my head but the, the things they call me in for they say oh those little bitty squeaky character kid teeny voices that's pretty much my niche whereas with Bill Fargaraki his niche is big stupid guy <laughs> right that's what he does really well yeah, and he's like, not a big stupid guy, I'll tell you no. that. Well, so what I find it's funny is because you think Patrick, you think of like the mummy from like Under Wraps, you know, funny guy, big goofy guy. But then when you think like of that anime show, you're like, how do you keep from not being so funny into that show? You know what I'm saying? Like, because it was kind of dark compared to other shows a little bit. I think it's just, uh, just acting so skills. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just, you do what's required. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that's what I do in the studio. If I ever have to burp, I just go like this and the engineer knows and then he records my burps. I almost had a burp. I was going to give it to you, but it left. <laughs> I have a question. It just like just popped out of my head just now. When I was younger, I would like watch this Nick Jr. show with my sister called Oswald and you were the voice of the hot dog Mimi. So what was it like working with... Oh man, I forgot his name, Fred something from the Wonder Years, and can you do Weenie's Bark for me? Yeah, it was Fred Savage. Uh, yeah, he was the original Fred Oswald. Yeah. He uh, wasn't the Oswald for the show. rest of it. Um, and I was Weenie, his dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I was also caterpillar. Katrina, the little caterpillar. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my mother was voiced by uh, uh, Lorraine Newman. Oh, I know her, yeah. And uh, what else did I do in that show? Just some various incidentals. That was a great just cast. Like, just yeah, it was a really fun show. Yeah. It was a preschool s show, so it was uh, very slow paced. Speaking of, you know, different shows and their the, the feel of the show, Oswald, it came along at about this pace right here. Sort of like Blue's Clues. Yeah, that show as a kid. Yeah. And you wish Crystal Scales, I think that's her name, mm -hmm. was also the flower and Libby. Yes, yes, what? Crystal yeah. Scales was in that show as a flower, was also Libby on Jimmy Neutron. Yeah. 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 Do the long hair, you better end up. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, what, is there a significant difference in atmosphere or in technique? between doing children's shows, because I also saw that you also did, uh, you did all four and you also did Voices for Clips with a Red Dog. Yep. Is there a difference in atmosphere or in any respect between doing shows for small children and more grown-up shows like Jimmy Neutron or, uh, or anime? Or yeah, there's a definite difference. I mean, the mic technique's the same, the script technique's the same. For me, it's the difference in pacing and in a, a Western style animation where, where it's not anime, where you record the voice first, they usually allow for more um, freedom with the wording. And uh, in a in an older skewed show, your improv would be different than say a younger skewed show. Okay. Usually in a younger skewed show preschool, uh, because they have to go through so many um, I forget the position's name, but they have to be approved by their educational director every single phrase. You, there's a little less freedom to be loose with the script as opposed to F is for Family, which is the raunchiest show I've ever worked on in my life, and it's full of bad words and things. <laughs> things. Yeah. things. Are we the cutest? anime mascot ever, I'm pretty sure. Would you do Real Loki's voice? Um, I usually do the transition, uh, Cat Bunny Spaceship. Um, <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> but if you like Real Oki, you gotta watch Glitter Force.
It's okay. a new show on Netflix. It's kind of like Powerpuff meets Sailor Moon. And um, all these, you know, sorry, the uh, anime looking girls are like, Glitter Force Makeover! And I'm this little bunny cat thing, similar to Rio Oki, okay. with a very high pitched voice. <laughs> That's awesome. Come on, you can do it! <laughs> like that. Thank you so much. That's awesome. And it used to be called Candy Pure, I think. So if you guys would Google it. Uh, Glitter Force from Japan. It had a whole different name. And then shout it out, and then I'll see if I'm right, because that's CRS again. <laughs> did you do the voice of Pac-Man? Because I see it right here. Yes, I did the voice of Pac-Man in Smash Games, I think it was called. Mm. Yeah. And again, I thought I was Mrs. Pac-Man. It had been a couple of years, and someone said, you were that voice. And I'm like, really? I just forget. There's it just is like a blur sometimes because you go in and you do it and then you leave and, and then it's time for the next job and then you forget and then you have to ask for the ref voice when you go into session again and they play you what you auditioned for or play you what you did before and you know there's some characters that you do so much like Jimmy Neutron or Monster High that, that I know and I'm not going to forget those but some of the video games you don't get continuity on them and you don't you don't know what's happening scene to scene. Like I do this one called Guild Wars 2. Anybody play Guild Wars 2? Yeah. I'm the voice of uh, Tiny. She's um, a really smart teenager who can't walk and she rides a golem and she solves all the problems and she's pretty amazing. And um, why was I gonna remember this? Oh yeah, because there's no continuity there. Like I just go from line to line and from scene to scene and you don't know what's happening. I imagine you didn't do it like the Saturday morning Pac-Man of the 80s, which was like, I'll feel much better after I have some Pac pellets. That was. Yeah, wasn't that? that, was, was. Wasn't that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the less said about this, less about that, the better. Uh, that dude, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, what was it like working with the voice actors of the Barely Off Parents, SpongeBob SquarePants, and Danny Phantom in the Nicktoons video games? Uh, in the video games, uh, video games you work alone, so you don't work with anybody else. Um, you go in and have a stack of close to a thousand lines and you start the session and you go full on till you're done. So again, there's no back and forth. In the um, you know Jimmy Timmy Power Hour or something, then you're usually in studio with them. But because video game clips are, are measured portions of, of time that have to be filled with th these many words, that's what the director does. He's just going from one segment to the next. And so you have to be in your character, high energy, all the time. So yeah, I didn't work with them. Nobody does. They're lying. You work alone. <laughs> I just wanted to say the you want to know the name. Yeah, yes. Yeah, is Smile Precure. Smile Pretty Cure? Smile Precure. Smile Precure. Smile Precure. I think it's pretty cure. Look now, Google pretty cure. Pretty cure. I'm looking at Wikipedia but, right now. It's smile pretty cure. But now Google. Pretty we all know cure Wikipedia is always right. If, uh, <laughs> but Google pretty cure and see if um, my character. There are two different series. But it looks the same, right? Candy, that little fluffy white ball that I talk for. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you flex. <laughs> I, I said I've heard it. Uh, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. No. Young lady in the back. Um, besides coming to conventions and meeting fans here, what has been your most memorable meeting a fan like out while you're walking and doing your thing? <laughs> well, being a voice artist, I um, this is the best part about being a voice artist is that it's fairly anonymous and people don't really know who you are. So uh, I don't get recognized too much for that. I get recognized for like I my preschool music, because I, I did concerts all over the United States. I was doing preschool music for seven years. And, oh, here comes a burp, one here. <laughs> <laughs> you um, got that right. <laughs> question, question, question. I'm... Well, now that everything's online, I get a lot of requests to be on people's blogs or their any kind of podcasts yeah. or and I, I can't say yes to everybody or I'd be being guests all day, every day. And so it's, it's hard to know who to say yes to and who not to. And, um, but I'm flattered 
that everybody, you know, wants me to be on their show. <laughs> I don't know what my memorable, besides comic conventions are. I like going to Comic-Con and um, in San Diego, well, I don't like going. <laughs> but when I'm there, then I'm just walking, like those are my people, right, at conventions, then people know who I am. Then I'll walk and people will say, I'll hear them go, that's Teddy Teddy Bear. And I'll be like, oh, here's one. When my kid was getting bar mitzvahed, or any bar mitzvah I'd go to, you know, where you're sitting quietly and everybody has to behave, I'd see the kids um, talk to each other, and I know what they're saying. His mom's too mean to try. <laughs> and then you'd see all the kids go, <laughs> like looking at me. <laughs> you know what they're doing. Maybe the occasional that. Um, do you, uh, how's your how's your singing career uh, working? You were doing you do country music. Well, I was doing kids music, first country kids music, music, and I had Honey Pig, the, like a Dixie Chicks band, for like seven years in LA. And then I, after I had my kid, I went into preschool music and like had number one hits. Baby Banana went to number one on the charts uh, for XM Serious, and that was super fun. And then I kind of hung that up and just stopped doing music for a little bit. And now I kind of resurrected it with, um, we did a voiceover concert at the Whiskey A Go-Go a few weeks ago. And so I got um, Jim Cummings and Billy West and me and Robbie Rist from Doc McStuffins together. And because so many voice artists are musicians. So uh, we're kind of back together. We did a gig there and we're just doing it for fun now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I get to sing when I book a Doc McStuffins or, you know, any of the cartoons where they sing. That's always fun. I got to be a singing piece of bacteria last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. When you said that uh, you've, you've got this niche for yourself, um, has there any been some opportunities you've been able to just completely abandon it? Uh, either in any form, you've ever been, yeah, yeah, you've been something that wasn't what people expect of you? Well, in a video game, uh, the way the contract works is that they get you for three voices. So although they're not gonna cast me, as the as a mom for my primary voice or a soldier for my primary voice i do get my second and third voice to be soldier or mom or some other voice so i do get to do that once in a while but for the most part um oh wait no that's i have a a, a commercial coming up i can't tell you what it is but <laughs> i'm um I'm kind of segueing into granny voices a little more now, and she's a, let's see, she's a granny voice, and she's a, she's Midwestern. Yeah, she's a granny, and she's mid, Midwestern for corn sakes. That's what she is. Yeah. So I, I'm auditioning more for that. Um, but it's pretty much in my niche, yeah. yeah. But I tell people, um, in my new book, Voice Over 101, how to see it as a voice actor. Um, uh, hand me one of those, one for one over here. Yes. They're 15, and I have them here with me. They're also available as electronic books. Um, e books. <laughs> electronic books. Um, what was I saying? About breaking out oh, yeah. the trolls. Um, although it's really important to be able to do so many different voices and to channel um, characters that you know in your life and to be able to put different voices in different places in your head and add layers to it, there is going to be your very comfortable spot. And that comfortable spot is what you want to sell. The other ones have to be in your wheelhouse in case something comes through. But for me, it always starts at, at one of three places. Like, you know, if it's right here in my nose, or if it's right here in my chest, or if it's down lower. Like a teenager one for me would be like right around here. Typical teenage voice, and um, they usually get a little bit of attitude for a teenager, and then you look at the copy or the script, and it's like, okay, she's from Tennessee or somewhere in the South, so there you have it, teenager, and now she's in the South, okay, and then you look at the copy, and. Okay, guess what? She has braces on, so you put that on top of it. And then you have this teenager who's a brat, and she's from the south, and she's got braces. And you just kind of put these little layers on top of it to get your character, whatever it is. 
Which you can read in this book. The answer may be in that book. I it was just you've talked about your home studio. Uh, does are we talking literally a home studio there, and what, what does that look like for a voice artist? Um, it usually looks like some foam somewhere, corner ceiling. It's actually in my book. I have a picture of it on page something or other. Um, everybody's house has a different layout, so every home studio is going to look different, unless you just want to spend the three to six grand to get a whisper booth, which is like the size of an old phone booth. Um, I just have a three, one, two, three sides of foam with a hinge wall and a foam ceiling and a carpet, uh, velvet double back drapes behind me and a mic and one on the ceiling. Some people use something called a porta booth that's uh, I have in my hotel room now that's just a, a square of foam that collapses flat. I put my uh, mic on my iPad and I have a software that records off the iPad so I can uh, record wherever I'm traveling or at home. And those are mostly used for auditions, but I recorded lots of stuff there that they've just used the clips and the production's fine. And there's so many ways of adjusting, you know, the, the production after it's recorded. It's not expensive to have a home studio. You can spend a lot of money on it, but I tell people when they're just starting to just get what you need for now. <coughs> Was there ever something that uh, you were in contention for that you really wanted, didn't get, and then glad you later on you didn't get it? No. <laughs> but there is something that I got that I wanted and that I got fired from that was really not fun. Animaniacs. I was oh, I was Fifi Le Few. The original Fifi Le Few. Really? Yes. And then uh, that was way back when I was beginning. And I, they called me back in and my enunciation wasn't uh, clear enough. And they gave me some chances and they weren't saying, if we can't understand you, we're going to replace you. But they didn't say that to me. They just went ahead and replaced me. So that was very sad for me. And I, um, was that Animaniacs? Tiny Toons. Tiny Toons, that's what I meant. Tiny Toons. Tiny Toons. So yeah, I was that and that. And then it also came down between me and Tress for Dot on Animaniacs. And I didn't get it, but uh, you know who better to go to than Tress? But it, it always comes down to the same—I don't know—it's just the same 20, 30 of us that audition for it, or end up as the the finalists or something. But hundreds of people, thousands, audition for this stuff. It's it's a tough business to get into, and it's not closed off. It's just a lot of work, and it's it's a lot of acting training. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. I know we only talked a little bit about Zach, but like, can you go over like the audition process, maybe like how you were selected? Did you get along with the other voice actors, like the voice actor for Keo? Um, again, it's anime. Anime is never recorded in groups. It's oh, always right. separate, except for the director. It's just you and the director. And um, I think it was just a, a few people that went in and auditioned. I mean, you, you get your connections. And I think Jamie called me up and they were, they were like, we're doing some auditions for this little crazy boy character, come in and read for it. And so, you know, I probably passed by the studio between sessions and, and read for it. And it's so long ago, who remembers, you know? Um, and again, when it, I didn't know that there were like 7,000 episodes to do <laughs> when we started doing it. They don't tell you that. But you, you become very close with your director. Like I, uh, there's this director I work with, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who does, uh, she says, Steve Blum, Bloom's girlfriend. And we spend a lot of time in the studio together and it's, you get really close, it's very fun. And it's, it's a lot of hours in a dark room. <laughs> and um, you, uh, you teach as well out in uh, LA too. You, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, in case some, say somebody out there finds themselves transplanted in Los Angeles. Well, I actually Skype uh, lessons all over the oh, world. Skype? Okay, I have students right. in Germany, um, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas, <laughs> Tennessee, New York. I have students everywhere. And <clears throat> I didn't 
mean to start teaching, but people wanted some coaching here or there, and it started out gradually, and I was coaching some kids' classes. Um, people in Atlanta, they come out to LA and, you know, get their feet wet. And now, I don't know how, what happened. I was voted best voiceover teacher in Los Angeles, and I have a lot of people who come to me for coaching and to do their demos and to get into the business or just hand-holding or um, strategy plans. But I've been in the business for a long time and I, I really try to be honest with people and um, I'm pretty mean. I'm not very nice about it. I try to be, but I, I don't really... It's a mean business. <laughs> it's, it's tough. And I'm not going to waste anybody's time, you know, saying, oh, that was great. I'll, like, stop them right away. I'll be like, no, I asked you to do this. You're not doing that. Listen, and I'll show them the voice pattern. I'm like, look at what you're doing. And uh, I help people set up their studios, although I'm not an engineer. I, you know, can guide people sort of. But there are specialists that help you set up home studios. So I don't know how I got into teaching, but it has become a very big part of my life now. I have to schedule students in between sessions all the time from really early in the morning to really late at night. Because you never know if somebody, I see an audition come in from Disney and it goes out and I'm like, ah, oh, now I have seven people wanting coaching on this one job. Oh, wow. But it's super great and I, I Don't love- Don't tell anybody this, <laughs> but I want to audition for you. <laughs> it, it's really uh, rewarding. And I am um, grateful that people trust me to help them do the best they can at, at voiceover. Are you, uh, are you accepting uh, students at this time? Yeah, I do take pretty much anybody uh, at any time. If you want to email me, it's info at debbiederryberry.com. And, and since you all have, are following her Facebook and Twitter and everything else, you can find out that information. And if you came in late, please go to Twitter on your smartphone and follow me. Nobody's taking out the phone. Take it out. Oh, you're all Let's following already. already. <laughs> Debbie Derryberry. What's on the back of that? Um, notes. <laughs> Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, you know, notes for people with CRS. <laughs> and on that note, that is probably going to be our time. Debbie, thank you so much for spending this time with us.